So we've been going through these uh, churches, uh, seeing what it is that the Lord revealed to John as he sat on the Isle of Patmos, cut off away from those he loved, uh, just in a place where God could really speak to him uh, and he'd listen clearly and understand and, and recall what was being said. And some of this is uh, easy, much of it's difficult, much of it's hard. Not that the words are hard, not that they're put together in, in difficult ways, they're not words that we don't understand the meaning of. It's just their impact sometimes is, is, feels a bit harsh. Feels a bit uncaring, perhaps. It feels a bit like something we really don't want to know. And certainly as we try and apply it to our own lives or the lives of those we love or the lives of uh, our church, it perhaps becomes difficult. But it's here for our help. It's here to help us know more about the God that we love and serve. It's, it's here to help us with the way that we live our lives day by day. And it's really easy to miss out bits of the Bible you don't particularly like. Bits of the Bible you, you perhaps find difficult or, or perhaps don't agree with. It's really, really easy to make God in our image instead of accepting that we're made in his image. So here we have this, this church. Thyatira was a okay sort of church, really. It would seem, uh, I wonder. And here's the message that comes to them. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, so what sort of town was it? What, what sort of place was it? What would you think if you rocked up at the gates and said, have you got a room for the night? Would it be on your list of uh, sites that you would want to visit when you'd looked at your tourist guide? What did it have about it that might have attracted you? Perhaps very little. From a human point of view, it was a working person's town, we're told. Manufacturing went on. It was filled with many trades guilds, many organisations that grouped together people who worked in particular lines, cloth making or dyeing or leather work, bronze working perhaps, pottery. But the most significant thing that we might know about it, apart from this mention here in Revelation, is through Acts. Because in Acts chapter 16 and verse 14 we read, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. That's it. So she lived in this city. She was a God worshipper. So within the city, there was the opportunity to worship God. Uh, and clearly, she worshipped a God in a way that made her open when Paul spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ that made her understand. Whether because it sounded familiar or whether it sounded a huge contrast to what her previous way of life had been in her relationship with her God, we don't know. We're told that uh, Thyatira hosted a major cult of Apollo, the son of Zeus, the deity associated with, the, with prophecy and the sun. And Roman emperors liked to be linked with Zeus as well. So they'd often come and worship Apollo. And so it's thought that they might have come to Thyatira and as is, this was supposed to be his earthly manifestation and they would have worshipped there. So that would have got them 
there's some notoriety as well. And, and many of the trades we've talked about, all of the trades that we've talked about that were uh, centred here wouldn't have been unique to this particular place. But this uh, Bronze Workers Guild in the city perhaps was root of some of the issue that Jesus was talking about when he came and talked to John about this city. So we start as we've started in other evenings with a description of some other aspects of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 18, the second part said, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. And we've learnt in the times that we've been looking through Revelation that these you know, aren't literal, they have uh, some sort of meaning. Christ's description of himself as a speaker to this church is that he's the Son of God. These are the words of the Son of God. And that's a juxtaposition of, from the city that he's writing about. Because the city that he's writing about, this uh, place of worship of Apollo and the emperor, they're just sons of the chief god, Zeus. Not sons of the, the god. Just one of many gods, Zeus. He might have been the chief, but he was just one of many in that particular culture. And interestingly, this title, the Son of God, isn't used anywhere else in Revelation. The Son of God has eyes like flames of fire and feet like polished bronze, it tells us. A little further back in Revelation, in Revelation 1, 14 and 15, it describes him in this way. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes were like blazing fire, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. Another description in Daniel, it describes him this way. His body was like chrysalidite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, his voice like the sound of a multitude. You see, the blazing eyes indicate the penetrating power of his vision. And that's what we know of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us that know him and love him, we understand something that might be absolutely petrifying to those that don't know him and love him. That he just doesn't see us, all of us, every human being throughout all time and time to come, not just see us as we present ourselves to each other, but see into our thought life, see into our hearts, see into our motives. Nothing is hidden from him. And the feet of bronze talk about the strength for executing judgment. He has the right and the power to judge. So as he describes himself to this church, he's saying, I know all about you. Be careful. You can't hide anything from me. I know everything about you, and I do have the right to judge. And having judged, to sentence goes on to make it even clearer. Jesus, he knows everything. Verse 19 says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did before. What a great way to start. Wouldn't you like somebody to say to you that to you about your spiritual life? As this is written to this church, 
There's emphasis on their love and their faith, on their service and their perseverance. Their love and faith. The service, the things they do for God. And when things don't go quite the way that they expect them, their perseverance to keep on, keeping on. Romans 2 and verse 7 says, To those who by persistence in doing good and seeking glory, honour and immortality will be given eternal life. You see, there's a reward for being persistent. There's a reward for being persistent. Now, I'm not talking to about those annoying people who keep ringing you up asking about your PPI. But that persistence to keep on keeping on, to not give up, to keep on, when all seems lost, when, when your dreams don't appear to be happening, that loved one you've been praying for for so many years doesn't seem to have any notion of what's going on spiritually at all. Perseverance. Perseverance. It's really lovely, isn't it? As I said, it was great to hear the testimony of those four people last weekend as they went through the waters of baptism. But just hearing other people's testimony or or meeting somebody you haven't seen for a long time and hearing how God's worked in their lives in amazing ways, just hearing part that perhaps something you've said or, or the prayers you've been praying for such a long time that seem to be so fruitless... Actually, God's heard and and God's been working. Yeah, I'd really like it to happen sooner and more obviously. But God is at work in the hearts and lives of those that we pray for. Like the church here, we need to be those that persevere, that are persistent. See, the The believers here are commended for those good deeds. When Christ says he sees them and knows them, it's their good deeds as well as their not-so-good deeds that he knows. He knows how they love one another. He knows about their faith. He knows the way they move by his guidance in areas that they don't see happening yet. That's what faith is, isn't it? Moving and doing things. You don't quite know what's supposed to be happening, but you're just obedient to the moving of God through Spirit. For the way they serve one another. And did you notice too that they were commended that they're now doing more than they did at first? They have a growing faith, an active faith that they're moving on in their faith. It's, it's not just about conversion, which is great, but they're moving on continually. It, it's like when you read the Bible. I, I, I've had a Bible for a long, long time now. And you would have thought after all this time, somebody as intelligent, not to say handsome and wonderful as I am, would know everything about it, and there would be no surprises anymore. But isn't it wonderful when you turn up a passage that's familiar to you and suddenly God tells you something else through those same words. He reveals something more of himself from those words. And then we go out and do something about it. They were a church who were doing more and more good work for the Lord. And Jesus wants to commend them for it. But there is an issue. The church is too tolerant. Ooh. Oh. We live in a society where tolerance is all. We live in a society where we're supposed to 
love everybody and accept everybody and whatever they want to do is, is fine and we just have to stand and watch and not intervene. Or at least that's the way it sometimes feels. But even in our tolerant society, there are limits. If you feel felt inclined to strip off, and I wouldn't advise it because they're still raining out there, and run naked down the street, somebody's going to stop you. But we're supposed to be tolerant of other faiths, other people's interests, other people's feelings. And yet Jesus has a an issue about this church being too tolerant. There are some specifics that he talks about, but it's a church that's too tolerant. If we get a wrong view of Jesus, and it's awfully easy to do so, Jesus meek and mild, we too can become too tolerant. We need to have a clear idea of what God's saying to us, what he stands for, in order to reflect that to the world around us. In this case, we read in verse 20, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, as this letter's written and as it's shared, the fingers aren't pointed at a lady in the church called Jezebel. Jezebel is a, is, is a pseudonym. It's a, it's a reference to the nature of a biblical character. In 2 Kings 9 and verse 22, it tells us that when Joram saw Jehu, he asked, have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace, Jehu replied, as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? You see, Jezebel is a character that the church would have known from the scripture. It was a church, it was a person that they would have been able to read through the words and understood what was going on. There was idolatry and witchcraft going on that she was at the centre of. There was a sin that she helped to, uh, helped to generate and to see grow. Not content with being a sinful woman, she was a woman who wanted others to join. This person in the church that we're thinking about was seducing people into the worship of idols and into sexual sin. Thyatira, it seems, had the opposite problem to that of Ephesus. You remember Ephesus would have been good at dealing with false teachers. They're commended for their dealing with false teachers, but they didn't love very well. But they were good at the tough love stuff, but not very good at the arm round of the shoulder stuff. You see, here the church had lots and lots of love. Lots of love. People were welcome to join. The doors were thrown open and all were made to feel welcome, it would seem. but they become tolerant, therefore, of the views that other people brought in with them. They become accommodating. Well, well, if that's the way you see it, we'll, we'll change things around so they suit you better. If that's what you think, then, then we'll do that. And as was happening in Pergamum, the church here at Tyrathyra was tolerating false teaching and they were compromising with their pagan society. We live in a pagan society.
You see, because many of the people in this church were tradesmen, there were things that you did as tradesmen. They, they belonged to the guilds. Guilds were like clubs for like-minded people. So, you know, you'd have a guild who were tent makers, and the tent makers would all go along to their guild meetings, and they'd all discuss tent making, because that's what they had in common. But just discussing their line of work, their line of interest, the things that floated their boats, there were other things involved in their coming together as guilds as well. It appears they'd meet on a regular basis, perhaps once a week or once a month. Sound like a club you belong to? And at these, uh, these banquets, there'd be some idolatry going on. The uh, clubs, societies, these guilds would have their god, the god of the tent makers. Don't know how you get to be a god of a tent maker. Uh, and they'd sacrifice. They'd have offerings to the god of the tent makers. I doubt if it was called the god of the tent maker, but anyway. So they'd sacrifice. And as part of their celebration, because of the nature of the world in which they lived, there'd be sexual license as part of their celebration. Jezebel, it would be good to assume, or likely to assume, that she was encouraging believers, you know, these tradespeople, to become part of the guild to be involved in the activities as part of what would be their civic duty. Uh, and that made some sense. You see, if you were a tent maker, but you weren't part of the guild, the club, economically that would be bad news. When people looked up in the yellow... Oh, no, it wouldn't be yellow pages. When people searched... The, no, no, it wouldn't have internet... When people went and asked who was the best tent maker in town, if your name wasn't part of those on the guild, you wouldn't get a mention. You'd have to work hard to get trade. There would be an economic barrier to following the trade that you'd chosen or had been given to you by birth if you weren't part of the guild. And it seems that Jezebel was encouraging those involved in trade to become part of the guild. And as part of the guild, they're being enticed to being involved in idolatry, sexual immorality. Yeah, we'll come back and think about that in a minute. Where's that gone? So God's judgment comes in these words, in verses 21 through to 23. I have given her time to repent, that's Jezebel, of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. The message goes on, divided into four main headings, about what is being said to the people involved. First of all, to Jezebel. To Jezebel, we're told, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. One thing I'm so pleased about my God is his patience and loving kindness. But however patient, however loving and kind he is, 
there are limits. And it seemed Jezebel had been given opportunity. Perhaps other people in the church or, or people ministering on the, you know, wayside ministers or, or by some method, perhaps directly from God, she'd been told that her ways needed adjusting. And she decided that she wasn't going to do anything about it. The message says, I, God, I have given her time to repent. Five seconds, five weeks, five years, I really don't know. A gracious God has given her time to repent and return to true faith. But to no avail. A punishment, it says, she will physically suffer. God's going to take dramatic action. He's going to intervene in her life in a way that is obvious and clear, both to her and the people around her. You know what it's like when somebody in the church is unwell. You're aware of it. So too here. You see, God's judgment just isn't upon her. It's about the hangers-on too. You know, those people that aren't really involved, they're just sort of on the fringes. They're not taken up by it, but they're just on the edge of what's going on. The influence is, is having some impact, but it's not great. He says, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. Who could these be? What grading of people might we call these? Perhaps it's the people that have heard the message. You, you need to get down to your guild. You really need to go to those tent makers meetings. I, I know you don't like them. I, I know they're a bit weird down there, but you ought to be in the world with them. Oh, okay, I'll go. If you say so, Jezebel, it must be the right thing to do. I will make those who commit adultery with her, those that are in cahoots with her, those that are close to her, those that are following her instructions, those that are doing what she's suggesting, and make them suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. Even at this stage, God's heart of graciousness <coughs> continues to give them an opportunity for repentance, an opportunity for the light to shine into their lives and hearts and to say, oh, she's got it all wrong. Oh, thank you, God, I really understand now that you don't want me to be doing this. I I'm sorry, I repent. Please forgive me. Help me to be faithful and obedient. But what about those that are really bought into it? What about those that we might call her acolytes? What about those? Those that are keen foreigners. Jezebel, wow, anything she says I'm going to do. She says I've got to go to the tent makers meetings. I'm going to be the, in charge of the tent makers. I'm not going, you're just going to go to the guild. I'm going to be the treasurer or the secretary or whatever it is. They're really bought into what she's saying. Nothing that she says is without... Uh, is questioned. In verse 23 it says, I will strike her children dead. And children is figurative. It doesn't mean the children of this lady. It means those that are bought into it. Those that are following. Those that are close. Those that do just whatever she says. Those that are not quite so involved are given a further opportunity to repent. This group are too close for that. They're too bought in. 
and the judgment upon them, I'll strike them dead. Oh, you know, you're messing with my mind again. I, I can't get it. You keep talking about the graciousness of God. You keep saying that I can come and come and come again and ask for forgiveness and God will forgive through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, through all that he's done. And yet you're now telling me that there are limits? You're now telling me that there's going to be a time when... I'm not telling that appears to me what Scripture is telling us. And what about the rest of the church? What about the everybody else? What about those that aren't the tent makers or the guild of, I don't know, shield makers, whatever? What about them? Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Because within this church, there'll be people that weren't followers, that weren't bought in, that, that didn't just go along for the ride either. There'll be that group of people that say, whoa, I'm not sure about this. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure this is the right thing to do. And to this group, he says, you'll know. You'll know that I'm a God who searches your hearts, that searches your minds, that repays you according to your deeds. And then there's the rest of the church. Here's the guidance of the church. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold to what you have until I come. You see, there's many in this church that take no notice of her. They don't give a time, they don't listen, they're not seduced to do the things that she's suggesting they do. They're not keen on this so-called deep secrets. Some churches have little groups of people within the fellowship who think they have super knowledge or super interest. And here, that group of people are called those that know Satan's so-called deep secrets. But on the rest of you, you're burdened enough. You've been living in this turmoil. You've been trying to live as you believe God wants you to live, and all this is going on around you. To you, only hold on to what you have until I come. Some had seen through her deception. Some were trying to get rid of Jezebel and her false teaching from among them. Christ's not going to replace responsibility for this action upon them. But just hold, to hold on tight. Hold on tight to the truth. Hold on tight to what they know of the Lord Jesus Christ, to what they've been told and taught about, the way they should live their lives, the way they should go on. So what about these blessings that are mentioned towards the end? They're conditional blessings. They're conditional blessings for those that are faithful. In verses 26 to 28, it says, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over all nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pot pottery, just 
as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. There's a faithful group in the church who have sought, despite what's going on around them, to be faithful to their calling, to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's taken their sins away. And they're going to be blessed. They're going to have greatness thrust upon them. In the difficult things they've gone through, they've stood firm. They've been faithful. And the reward comes. Authority over the nations. Psalm 2, 8 and 9 says, Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth for your possession. You will rule over them with an iron scepter and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. It's figurative language. It's figurative language. The the psalmist is trying to explain what it's going to be like. Uh, And perhaps it doesn't quite come across to us in a way that's helpful to us. Perhaps it does. Neither part of it fits comfortably somehow with our 21st century mentality. Because as nice Christian people, we wouldn't want to rule over anybody. Oh, that's not what we're called for. To rule? Oh, no, 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 no. And what about smashing them to pieces like pottery? Or ruling with a heavy scepter? The picture is, the picture is perhaps revealed a little more clearly, much better, a little more clearly in Revelation 3. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You see, as sons and daughters of the living God, we have a place in heaven. And I don't know what your understanding of your place in heaven's like, but when you get there, you're going to feel that you're the most important person after God and the Lord Jesus Christ in the whole of eternity. Because God will love you and love you and love you just like he does now, But when you're in heaven, you'll just understand that in so much clearer a way. You won't be separated by sin. You won't be having those those things, those, those problems that you have now with how other people behave and what other people think about you and what else is going on because all of that's wiped away. You'll sit in stand in, exist in, depending on your view, the heavenly realms where you've just received God's endless, beautiful, unconditional love forever. And compared with those that are going to the other place, because there is another place, because if there wasn't another place, then heaven wouldn't be so special. That's like ruling over them. That's like they're like smash pottery. Hopes and dreams, any good feelings, any good emotions, all wrenched away from them. It's part of our urgency as believers to share the good news. Are we going to slip slip on because the time's running?
hypertrophy, excuse me, the moment. The references are down. You can have a look for yourselves later. Christ is called the morning star, both in Revelation and in 2 Peter. Revelation 2.28, 2, 22.16, and in 2 Peter uh, 1.19. The morning star appears just before the dawn, we're told. While the night is coldest and dark, darkest, suddenly a glorious sun appears. When the world is at its bleakest point, Christ is going to burst onto the scene, like that morning star. Suddenly the world is going to change from that dark, cold night into brightness. The evil will be exposed. The truth will come. And the promised reward. Is that your vision of where we're going and what we're doing? As believers, is that what you're looking forward to? The judgment complete and the example set. Verse 29 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen, hear, understand. Listen, hear, understand. That's what we're told to do. Listen, hear, understand. What about you? What about you? Do you listen to what God's saying? And when you've listened, do you actually hear what he said? I have very selective hearing. It's part of my gender. My wife says she tells me lots of things, and I say, no, you never have. I don't remember you saying that. When did you say that? And she can repeat the moment what I was doing at the time, what I was wearing, every detail. We're encouraged not just to listen, but to hear. And having heard, to understand. the church was reasonably okay. Somebody had brought in some deceit and encouraged people away. Bit by bit. It was just, you know, well, I think we ought to relate a bit more to the world around us. I think we ought to be more involved in the community. Careful. If we don't relate to the community around us, we've got nobody to share the gospel with. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved in our community. But this lazy lady Jezebel was suggesting more than just being involved in the community. And we need to be careful. Careful that although our motives might be right, when we're away from the family of God, we're clear about what it is we can and should be doing, what we shouldn't and can't be doing. God gives us wisdom. God's left his Holy Spirit with us. If there are areas that you're not sure about, before you get in too deep, share it with somebody. Talk to somebody else in the church. Think about it. Pray about it principally. Pray about it. Ask God if it's the right thing to do. Do you know people who used to run hard for the gospel and got involved in some really good community project and ended up spending so much of their time in that project or that place or that that they had no time left for God and meeting with God's people? That's a real fine line. That's a real fine line. Because if we all stay in our churches all the time and we don't go, we 
got no gospel to share. Now, I hope that we're very clear about uh, worshipping idols when we're involved in the community or sexual immorality and when we're working in the community and perhaps those things will flag up really large in our minds. What about time issues? As we get more and more involved, what about time issues? What about being friends of the world and missing out on friends in the family, the church of God? Wouldn't it be great if I could put up a slide that divides down the half and says, this half, good things to do, do these. This half, don't do these. But I can't do that for you. But an active prayer life, a faith that you can share with brothers and sisters in the faith, will help you know where that guideline is for you personally and individually. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading that we've had tonight. We thank you for this model that's being put in front of us, this example that we've been given. And we pray that you'd help us to apply it to our lives, our own lives, not the lives of others around us unless we're invited to. Help us to know your will and purpose. Help us to know what you want us to do. And as we seek your face and ask you for guidance, about areas of our time, of our lives, of our involvement with those around us. That by your spirit you'd be clear to us and that we'd be obedient to. As we've read, this lady would have seduced people slowly into moving closer and closer to things that were far, far away from you. It wouldn't have been evident at the beginning, it would have seemed a, like a good thing to be done, do. And yet the result was such horrendous judgment. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you that you extend such grace to us. Help us to be grateful that you are the ever and all-seeing God. Help us to live lives that are open before you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.